will be used in later missiles. This is another part of Convair's job, testing items manufactured to certain design specifications to ensure maximum efficiency of the entire system. All the gyros used in the autopilot system must be checked out for rate of drift before being accepted. The microscope divides each degree of drift into 20 sections, and the drift rate is counted electronically at three-minute intervals. Repackaging work combined the two units of the Azusa-type transponder on the left, mounted on H-frames, into a T-frame chassis. This new T-frame represents further improvement in design. In Building 4, the first production line for the assembly of electronic subcomponents was activated during the first part of 1956. This subcomponent of the autopilot servo system is assembled item by item, beginning with a bare chassis and moved down before more, installed in the vacant areas seen here. The development, testing, modification, and manufacture of missile-borne electronics is just one phase of Convair's function as system integrator. This liquid nitrogen trailer was manufactured to Convair specifications to carry 2,000 gallons at minus 280 degrees for transfer to the helium gas cooler and the refrigeration system for the helium storage bottles on the missile. This helium gas trailer required for 2200 PSI helium storage and transport to the test stands for missile pressurization uses 30 gas cylinders manifolded together at each end. These helium and nitrogen trailers represent only a small part of the handling and ground support equipment in use or on order by Convair. Test towers, launchers, handling trailers, and other items will appear in following divisions of this film report. At the Air Force Missile Test Center on Florida's east coast, initial construction was underway on the Atlas Launching Center at Cape Canaveral. The exterior of Convair's Building J was completed, and installation was started on the electrical, air, and water lines to be contained in trenches set in the floor. There's floor space here for two complete missiles with their attendant systems, test, and checkout equipment. Seen at the top of the screen in this view. Because of the low marshy terrain at Cape Canaveral, it was necessary to truck in fill dirt, raising the level of the pad surface to 11 feet above mean high tide. This borrowed soil clearly outlines the configuration of each pad and the access road connecting the installations with the missile assembly area. The curved camera road at each complex circles the launching sites. The ready room and blockhouse for each stand will be located 800 feet from the firing area. From 1,000 feet, this was the appearance of the Convair sites in early March. Pad 12 in early March. This is the ready room, designed as a control center for all activities on the pad prior to firing. In the blockhouse area, just north of the ready room, excavation was complete, and footings and manholes for power lines were installed. Farther north, at pad 14, all the structural work on the ready room was complete and other construction was more advanced. Conduits between manholes one and two were in place, and the trench to the stand area was almost finished, ready to receive some of the conduit stored along its edge. The next day, pouring was started on the conduit lines, seen extending from manhole number two toward the stand area. This view shows the configuration of pad 12 and its relationship to the missile assembly and checkout buildings three miles away. Farther to the north, beyond Pad 13, which is being constructed by the Corps of Engineers, this was the configuration of the spanned area at Pad 14. This was early March 1956 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. In California, at the Sycamore Canyon off-site static test facility near San Diego, construction was paced by the schedule for the first hot run on a Series A missile in the fall of this year. The footings and walls for the first level of the blockhouse central control rooms were poured in late January, and the final pouring was made on the tunnel providing access to the transfer room in the stand area. The blockhouse has a 12-inch slab with walls one foot thick and is being designed to withstand an explosive force of 100,000 pounds of TNT. This sharp bend in the contour of the tunnel was made to help decrease blast effect inside the blockhouse. All excavations were refilled and recompacted in layers to the level of the escape hatch, 
seen projecting from the top of the tunnel. The tunnel walls were covered with waterproof membrane, sealed with pitch. At the transfer room, installation was started on the four-inch instrumentation conduit to the stand. Motion picture cameras placed at different points recorded the progress at Sycamore Canyon North on March 13th with the blockhouse in the background. The tower foundation was nearly complete. The 750,000 gallon water tank at the top of the hill was put up in 30 days. This tank will hold all the water needed for the coolant and firex systems at the site. To the north of the water tank, the concrete slab for the missile assembly building was poured in early February. By March 20th, the framework was up and the structure was ready to be enclosed. Scheduled for completion in early May, this building will have 14,000 square feet of floor space housing shop equipment for pre-firing checkout on two missiles at one time. In the firing area on March 29th, the base for the tower at stand S1 was almost completed. The face of the stand was ready for the installation of the flame deflector. The tower for stand S1 is scheduled for erection in April. The blast wall to the left of the stand will shield the helium trailer, pressure control unit, and the nitrogen trailer. March 29th. The area in front of the stand has been shaped, ready for the gunite. The road along the top of the hill to the missile assembly area and other access roads have been blacktopped. Sycamore Canyon, looking south again. From this to this, in less than three months, tangible evidence of real progress. The hold-down mechanism to be used at Sycamore Canyon in stand S1 was being fabricated near Building 4 at the San Diego plant. Installed in the stand to secure the missile during the captive firing runs, it is a modification of the actual launcher to be used at the Air Force Missile Test Center at Cape Canaveral. Also next to Building 4 at Convair, the mock-up for the 1-4 stand at Edwards Rocket Base was completed during the quarter. On March 24th, the thrust barrel and North American engine package for the 1-4 mock-up was installed in the stand which duplicates the exact dimensions of the 1-4 stand, saving valuable time in the proofing and manufacture of items scheduled for delivery to the actual test site. Among the items to be proofed in the mock-up stand are the accessory plumbing and tubing between the ground support equipment and the missile, instrumentation installation in the booster section, transducers and wiring, and instrumentation and electrical cabling between the test stand and the booster section. And lead crush rings were fitted under the spider support pins. To lower the missile, oil was bled from the hydraulic system at a predetermined rate. 34 channels of information were fed to a recording oscillograph inside the blockhouse. Instrumentation included strain gauges, pressure pickups, and accelerometers. Total drop weight of the missile with Spider, 396,350 pounds. Drop distance, one and a half inches. Maximum force developed, one and one quarter G. Testing interval, two tenths of a second. Results satisfactory. The base plate for the Point Loma launcher was set up in early February. On completion of the launcher, 10 hydraulic rams will be attached to it for applying limit loads. These tests will help determine the spring constants for support points. After these static tests, the launcher will be installed in the dynamic stand seen here in the background. The Point Loma test site on the last day of the first quarter, 1956. The first quarter of 1956 was marked by many advances in production techniques and a continuing increase of activities on the Atlas production lines in Building 4. On February 1st, this stub tank was moved into the autopilot test stand. Pressurized to 6 PSI, the tank was moved from the final assembly area in a horizontal position. The load bar permitted the riggers to insert the tank into the stand. When the tank had been secured in the stand, two cranes rotated the entire structure to an upright position. By the end of March, mock-ups of the engines had been installed in the tail section and the missile hydraulic system was complete except for vernier controls. A complete production system will have been installed and in test by the end of June. The aerodynamics of an operational missile will be simulated through the analog computer to evaluate flight performance as controlled by the autopilot. On February 6th, the tank slated for delivery to stand S1 at Sycamore Canyon was moved from the hydro pneumatic test tower to the final assembly area in Building 4. The tank structure, weighing 3,000 pounds empty, pivots on the handling fixture bolted to the thrust barrel attachment frame. The missile is lowered, 
The handling fixture is released from its pivot point at the base of the tower. The crane hook is removed, and the handling trailer pulls away. The weight of the missile is supported by the handling fixture at the aft end, and a forward handling fixture bolted to the nose adapter. The missile body is kept rigid between these two points by pressurization, 4 PSI in the LOX tank and 6 PSI in the aft fuel tank. The handling trailer moves as far as possible down the aisle of Building 4's East Bay, guided by the two operators at the rear wheel steering controls. Then the missile is raised by two cranes and moved to the final assembly dock, ready to receive it. This will be the first hot-run missile, scheduled for delivery to the Sycamore Canyon Static Test Facility in the fall of this year. Again, the missile is supported at only two points, by support pins inserted in brackets at the aft end and by a support under the forward handling fixture. Here, the thrust structure section for the Sycamore Canyon missile is moved into place to proof both production items for FIP. In the assembly of future missiles, the thrust structure containing the complete power package will be mated to the airframe in this manner. The overhead crane lowers the structure on a cradle, and the entire unit then moves forward on rails lined up with the final assembly dock. Inside Building 4's East Bay, this was the status of the missile checkout and final assembly areas on the last day of the quarter. The brown paper marker on the tank at the left, intended for Missile 2A, indicates the area where this tank was struck by some tooling rings and handling. The engineers ran 200 additional cycles of pressurization on the forward tank and 800 on the aft tank without finding any sign of structural damage. There will be dock space for final assembly work on six missiles at one time when the construction work has been completed in this area. The missile on the left is the Point Loma package is being installed in its thrust structure. In early May, this complete unit will be mated with the airframe in the manner seen previously. At the south end of the final assembly area is the proofing mock-up consisting of an aft bulkhead, thrust section, and pods. It is used to proof electrical and electronic harnesses, fluid and air lines, and hose assemblies. All of the different components manufactured by Convair and various subcontractors and associate contractors are integrated on this mock-up for manufacturing compatibility. This proofing is now complete for the Series A missile, and tools and production parts are being manufactured. The